All right, I had a couple of uh, folks stop by um, after class today or this afternoon or even in the evening to, to ask if I might do a little video on how to maybe more effectively draw these 3D structures on two-dimensional pieces of paper because you're going to have to do this on the exam. I think you got a little bit of practice in class and so I'm happy to help. Uh, this video may be a little bit long. I'm not sure how long it's going to be, but feel free to just kind of zoom along, uh, you know, to whatever part you're having a hard time understanding. If you don't, you know, need help in one part of the video, there's no need to watch this whole thing. So use whatever is useful um, and let's just kind of dive in. And so, uh, you know, one of the simplest molecules we can think about, right, is our, our good friend uh, methane, CH4, right? And We've got four uh, valence electrons from the carbon, one from each hydrogen, and so that gives us four plus four. That's eight electrons, right? And we can look at that molecule. We can draw that Lewis structure. At this point, you should be able to draw this very, very quickly. We know we're gonna have a carbon. We're gonna have at least one bond for each hydrogen here. And so we can draw it like this. Uh, my little uh, pen's a little weird today. It's kind of flattening out these structures. I don't know why, but I think you get the idea here. We've used eight electrons, right? So eight minus eight is zero. We're good there. And if we now, um, I'm going to go ahead and fire up Spartan, the program we're using in lab this week, and kind of put it in a little, uh, you know, kind of split screen here. And hopefully you can see I've got my tetrahedron. And you look at this molecule and you're gonna see very simply that you have one, two, three, four uh, bonding pairs, right? Each of those lines represents two electrons. So you have four bonding pairs and that's represented pretty easily here in this three-dimensional structure on the right-hand side. Now you can kind of rotate this in space and kind of look at it. You can build a model. And then, you know, what I typically do is I say, how can I capture this 3D picture on a two-dimensional piece of paper and this is the one this is the exact one I gave you in class and I kind of line it up this way and I say okay well if I do this now I can put um, you know I'm gonna have to clip uh, flip over here to the other program but notice I've got one two three um, atoms they're in a plane this little kind of triangle this little V shape here so I can draw those in the plane then I've got one coming out and one going behind me so how can I draw that well Let's go ahead and jump over here. The molecule is going to disappear, unfortunately. Um, so we're going to go ahead and draw the carbon in the middle. And remember the two were kind of off to the side here. And those were in the plane of the paper. And then to make one coming out towards me, I'm going to have to deviate from my typical little lines here. I'm going to have to say, okay, I'm going to use, have to use that wedge that is filled to give me the 1H. And then I'm going to use a wedge that is composed of dashed lines to show one going behind me. So if I bring that molecule back, I hope you'll see that is in essence one of the easiest ways to draw this molecule um, on a two-dimensional sheet of paper where I've got one, two, three. Um, sorry, my email's doing some weird things here. There we go, got rid of that. Um, I've got my, um, I'm gonna go ahead and just close my email so it's not interrupting again. Sorry about that, technical difficulty here. Um, so we have one, two, three atoms in the plane of the paper, so we can use these kind of flat, normal lines that we use for things that are in the plane of the paper. And then I've got this one hydrogen, right, pointing out at me, and the other one going behind the paper, kind of dancing here, right? And so we say, okay, we've got the hydrogen in front with the wedge that's filled, the, the dashed wedge goes in the back, and that's the best way I know of to draw a, um, a, tr a you know, tetrahedral uh, three-dimensional geometry. So I hope that helps some of you. Um, let's go ahead and uh, use this same geometry. But what I'm gonna do now is a little bit different. I'm gonna go ahead and, let's see, I'm, I'm gonna go ahead and try to, without, oh, there it goes. I'm gonna have to move off of this page for a minute. Um, let's go back to my build menu. Um, I'm gonna edit this. I'm gonna bring it back into frame. And so let's say for a moment, that instead of four bonding pairs, one of these bonding pairs is a lone pair. And so I would delete the one that we see. And now you can see, hopefully, that I have a little bit of a different geometry. Actually, it's quite a bit different, but it's still based on that tetrahedron, right? You just can't see this lone pair. And this would be very similar to a molecule like ammonia, right? This is one we did in class. And so the molecule is gonna just disappear, I apologize. So we're gonna have NH3. 
and again we're going to draw the Lewis structure so we have five valence electrons from nitrogen one from each hydrogen and that gives us a total of eight and you'll notice that's the same number that's isoelectronic with uh, the methane molecule and so what we can do here again at this point you should be able to do this in your sleep again the Lewis structure has no three-dimensional information so we can draw these however we wish and then I have to remember it's really important to put the lone pair there we have used the eight electrons and we're done and so if we look at the structure here this is really important we have one two three of the bonding right there's one two three bonds and then there's one non-bonding pair and I'm gonna go ahead and circle this in a different color just to kind of show here right this this non-bonding pair and of course that's a terrible drawing um, let's see if I can go back and um, maybe re-emphasize this lone pair there we go that's maybe a little bit better my pen software is just not doing well today I apologize but the idea here is we've got a, a bonding pair here a bonding pair here and a bonding pair here so that's that's four electron density regions or four electron pair regions if you want to call it that it doesn't matter it's all the same thing that is really not a whole lot different than the tetrahedron with the exception of the fact that the lone pair is going to push a little bit harder right it's going to show more repulsion than the bonding pair so that bond angle of the hydrogen nitrogen hydrogen is going to shrink a little bit this is in the notes we talked about today in class and so what we can do now is we can focus on how might we draw this in three dimensions and so it gets a little bit tougher you know if you kind of look at this and you say okay that's a pyramid right this is a trigonal pyramidal it's no longer a molecular uh, geometry tetrahedron right because we don't see that lone pair we see the molecule and I want to be really careful to say that we see the atoms we see one two three hydrogens around a central nitrogen and that lone pair is there right you see it over here there's a lone pair but we don't see just a pair of electrons you don't see that in the molecule and so when you draw this or talk or name it as a molecular geometry the what you see here is not including the lone pair you see a a pyramid right and if we look at it from the top that pyramid sits on a triangular base and that's why we call this a trigonal pyramid so this is really important so how might you draw this well there are a couple of different ways right you could draw it like this where you have one in the front and two kind of going behind the paper you can draw it that way in fact let's go ahead and just draw that one as an example we can say we have the the nitrogen here and I still you don't have to I mean um, always do this but I would encourage you to draw the lone pair just so you don't forget it and then you can say okay well I'm gonna have a hydrogen in the back I'm gonna have a hydrogen in the back and then I'm gonna have a filled wedge showing me that there's one in the front and I hope now that I bring that molecule back you'll see that's what I was attempting to draw in a very poor way because my pen again is just garbage right now um, but you see here we've got two behind the paper one in front if you don't like to draw it this way there's one other way you can put the hydrogen and the nitrogen in the uh, plane of the paper and then that way you only have one in the front and one in the back and let's go ahead and try to draw that one if you do that you can say okay well I've got the nitrogen I'm still gonna throw my lone pair in there and then I'm gonna say okay I've got my hydrogen and my nitrogen in the plane of the paper I'm gonna have one that comes out towards me assuming I can fill that up nice and strong and then a dashed one behind there and then that way now you can see this example of how you draw a three-dimensional version of the trigonal um, pyramid and this is really important you gotta show us on an exam as best you can and as accurately as possible how you can kind of translate these three-dimensional objects into a two-dimensional space and using those uh, solid wedges to show things that are coming out at you using the dashed wedges to show something going away from you and then finally if you're gonna keep something in the plane of the paper you can just draw a regular line but that's the only time you do that so I hope that that's helpful the last one is is rather trivial if we go uh, one more we can say okay um, well let's see here if we have I don't know um, if we have one more lone pair right if we have one more lone pair that means we get rid of a bonding pair and now we're left with this which is something like water so let's go ahead and draw that Lewis structure and of course um, we've done water so many times so hopefully this is really easy you've got six from the oxygen 
plus two from the hydrogen. Again, that kind of interesting uh, eight electrons, isoelectronic, these all have the same number of electrons. And so this one is really simple. You know you have to at least connect the hydrogens to something that is the central atom. And then you have four electrons used in the bonding. And now we're gonna have four electrons used in the lone pair. I'm gonna go ahead and circle these as best I can because these lone pairs take up a lot of space. They are awfully repulsive. And so if you think about it, again, this is four electron pair regions of, of influence, right? Or three electron density, or sorry, four, excuse me, four electron density regions, we can count them. There are two non-bonding, two lone pairs, and then two bonding. And so I'm gonna go ahead and circle those bondings just to make it really clear here what I'm talking about. The idea here that we've got two electrons locked into here, two electrons locked into here, two in there and two in there. And so at first glance, it's really no different than the first two we just did. These are all kind of based on the kind of family of tetrahedral electron domain regions of four regions that have electron pairs. But when we go to convert that to a molecular geometry, we do not see the lone pairs, right? All we see are the two hydrogens like we've seen in our Lewis structure there. But in order to convert this one to 3D, it's really quite easy because if you notice, this is a bent molecule. So this bent molecule can fit rather conveniently in the plane of the paper. There's no need to put something in front and in back. You can just make your life so much easier and put these three atoms in the plane of the paper. And in this case, your Lewis structure is essentially gonna be all, I mean, essentially identical to your molecular geometry because they are both of the atoms, the hydrogens that are bound to the oxygen are in the same plane. Now, if you want to go into even more detail, you could. Um, some people um, get really excited about, well, Dr. Porter, you say this is based on a tetrahedron, but I see you drawing this as a planar molecule. Well, you can think of it that way. Um, but one thing you might want to do is think about where those lone pairs actually kind of are oriented in three-dimensional space, if that bothers you. If not, just take this one for the win and be done. But if you're really worried about this one, you can say, okay, well, one of these lone pairs is kind of sticking out at us. And so we can say, okay, well, one of these lone pairs, if you really wanted to do this, you could say is kind of sticking out at us. And one of the lone pairs is going behind the plane of the paper. So you can kind of if, you, if it really bothers you, you can do it like this and help prove it to yourself that those lone pairs are influencing the geometry. But when you again bring back the molecule, you don't see the lone pairs, right? All you see is this, which is the molecular geometry. But if you're having a hard time seeing that, maybe it does you some good to remember that this is based on the tetrahedron. And so if you, if you kind of think of it that way, you've got this, um, tetrahedral that is made of four electron domain regions. But remember, we don't see the lone pairs. We only see the molecule, which in this case is going to be a bent molecule. So these are the only three options that you will see in this class based on the tetrahedron, right? If we go back to the one we just did, the, the first one rather, methane has all bonds, no lone pairs. And so everything is going to be oriented and you can see everything and you're going to get a tetrahedron. No problem. If you look at ammonia, we begin to see lone pairs. And in fact, we see the first lone pair, there's only one. And it occupies one of the tetrahedral spaces, which means we don't see that when we do the molecular geometry, because the molecular geometry, again, is only focused on looking at the atoms. And so here we can draw this in two different ways to throw, show the 3D uh, geometry. And then finally with water, it becomes so much easier because we have now not one, but two lone pairs or non-bonding pairs and two bonding pairs. And you can see from the discussion we just had, it's based on the tetrahedron, but we really only see the, the three atoms and those are arranged in a bent configuration. So I hope this has helped clarify a little bit of what we talked about in class. Um, a few of you were asking about some of the more complicated geometries and we can definitely talk about some of those. Um, let me go ahead and draw a, a new molecule here in the, um, Spartan build here. Let me see if I can go ahead and close this one. Uh, we don't want to use this one anymore. Don't want to save that. Come on, get rid of that. What are you doing here? Uh, we don't want to save that one. Okay, get rid of that. And I can build a new molecule and let me grab, I don't know, something like, oh, let's see if I can find this one here. 
There we go, that's a good example. And so you probably will notice I've skipped to from from four things around now to six. And this kind of looks kind of crazy, right? It's, it's quite a, a, a big chunk of atoms here. Um, but I would argue it's one of the easier ones. This is called an octahedron. An octahedron is very similar to a tetrahedron, right? These are platonic solids. And if you don't know what those are, those are essentially uh, solids that are composed of identical faces. I mean, it's a really, you know, superficial definition, but you can look up more if you're interested in classics and classical math and geometry. Um, the octahedron here, right, has six um, atoms here. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six. And I want to be really careful to sh here to show you that all six of these atoms are in the same environment. This is really critical. If you look at any one of these hydrogens, it's at exactly 90 degrees to its neighbor. Now, I say this because a lot of times people get confused with an octahedron and they'll start wanting to call things axial and equatorial and those do not exist for an octahedron. So get that, get that idea out of your head. Axial and equatorial, we'll save those for later in this video. So skip ahead if that's what you're worried about. But octahedrals only have one environment. They are all exactly the same. All the atoms are exactly 90 degrees from each other. There is no such thing. If I rotate it this way, if I rotate it this way, it is always the same because all these atoms are 90 degrees to each other and that's really important to realize. And so if we look at an octahedron, and we can do a molecule if you want to do one for fun. Um, let's go ahead and draw a Lewis structure. So the molecule is going to disappear when I do this. But probably one of the simplest and most commonly uh, kind of one of the poster ch children for octahedral is this SF6. And so remember that sulfur is going to be 6 and a fluorine, right, is going to be a, it's always a halogen, right? So if you think about this, you can say, okay, well, six times seven is, oh my goodness, isn't that like 42? And so this is probably one of the bigger ones you've seen. And so I believe this would be 48 electrons, which is pretty crazy. So sulfur is going to be in the middle, right? And we're going to have to try to, you know, for a Lewis structure, this is going to be a little bit challenging because we've got a lot of fluorines to kind of go around here. And I don't even know if I'm going to be able to fit them all in because I didn't, that I, yeah, I left enough room, just barely. I was worried I was going to run out of space there drawing these. But just to count, one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, I've got them all. And I've used what? One, two, three, four, five, six bonds. So that means I've used 12 electrons, right? Because there are two electrons per single bond. And so now I think that gets me down to what? That gets me down to 36, correct? And then I'm going to go around and I'm going to give each of these fluorines an octet because that's how you do a good Lewis structure. You connect them all and then you're gonna go ahead and go around the outside atoms if you have electrons left over. Always give the outside atoms their valence or their octet first, right? It's really important. So if I've done this, what do I, I've used six for each fluorine and I have six of them. So I believe I've used all of my electrons that remain and I'm done. And so now when you look at this, you're gonna say, wow, if you t tried to tell me that this was the 3D geometry, I would be really disappointed because right now this Lewis structure is only showing me kind of a flat structure. And we can tell if we bring back the octahedron, right? There are six bonding pairs of electrons, right? One, two, three, four, five, six bonds. And so we have those six pairs of electrons and they're gonna to wanna to separate as far as possible. And in class, I know we talked about 90 degrees being really tight and that's true. But there's no better way you can separate these. 90 degrees is the furthest away that any of these, these bonding pairs can get from each other. And so the octahedron is the best way. If you want to convince yourself, go ahead and calculate. Um, you'll find out that all of these, if you, try to, if you try to draw this flat and you do the calculations, right? You say, okay, well, what's 360 divided by 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, um, right? You've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. That's, that's what, like 60 degrees or so, or something like that. So um, that's much tighter. And so if you're able to spread out in a three-dimensional space, 90 degrees is tight, but it's sure a lot better than what it could be if you smush them all into the plane of the paper. And so the last thing I'll talk about for the octahedron is, how do you draw this monster on a piece of paper? Well, there are two ways that I typically recommend people, or recommend students do it. And there's the easy way, and then there's the book way. And again, your book is a good book and that's fine, but I'm gonna show you the Dr. Porter easy way. What I do is I kind of rotate this and do you see how I've now got one, two, three, four, including the central atom, five 
atoms that are in the same plane in this little cross, this square. And then I've got one, one atom in front of me and one atom behind me. And that's the, by far the easiest way to draw this, at least in my opinion. So I'm going to draw the sulfur in the middle. Don't worry, I'll bring the molecule back. And I'm just going to go, okay, here's a fluorine. Here's a fluorine. Here's a fluorine. And here's a fluorine. And let me bring the molecule back. And do we agree that looks kind of like... If I rotate it this way, I've got my four fluorines around the sulfur in the plane of the paper. And now I've got to draw the one fluorine in front of the paper and one behind. I don't know if you can see it poking out back there. It's kind of hard to see. It's almost eclipsed. And so the one behind the paper, I can easily do that using my dashed wedge. Put that one there. And the one in front of the paper, I can use my filled wedge. And there you go. And so to me, that kind of looks like this, right? Do you see that? You've got those two kind of poking in and out behind the paper and in front of the paper, and those other four forming that little cross right inside the or on the plane of the paper. To me, that's the easiest way to draw that. However, your book doesn't often like to do that. Your book likes to make things a little difficult. So here's how your book typically does it. Instead of putting four atoms in the plane, they'll put three atoms up and down here in the plane. So they're, your book's going to draw it like this. And I don't, I mean, you can draw it this way, and I've seen it like this in the literature in all kinds of places. And they're going to draw those three atoms like this. And if you do it this way, guess what happens? Now you've got two atoms behind the paper, and you've got two atoms in front of the paper. So that means you're having to use more wedges and more dashes, and that's that's not always the best way um, but you know it works so whatever makes you happy and allows you to be confident you can draw it like this and it is effectively the same thing both of these are octahedrals so I hope this helps you begin to think about how you might draw these now the nice thing about these is we can use these as examples for looking at other structures that are derivative, just like we did before. We started with tetrahedral, right? And we said there were in methane there were no lone pairs, and then we added one lone pair, and we got nitrogen or ammonia, which gave us our trigonal pyramid. Then we added another one to get two lone pairs, and that gave us a bent molecule. We can do that same analysis here. So if we start with this molecule, we can say, okay. This was the octahedral, right? This is the octahedral. And goodness, my pen is just really messing up today. I apologize. This is bad. So there's octahedral. So that had no lone pairs. So if we begin to look at something that would have a lone pair, and I'm not going to draw all the Lewis structures because this video is getting a little bit long, but if we look at something like IF5, this is going to have one lone pair and I want you to draw it on your own and you can see you're going to get the same Lewis structure except for SF6 but you're missing one of the fluorines so instead of one of the fluorines you're going to have a lone pair and so if you look at the molecule if we go to the molecule and we begin to think about how we would edit our molecule so go ahead and draw that Lewis structure while I'm working on this and I'm going to delete one of them and look what we get now if we remove one of the fluorines and replace it with a lone pair, you see how the geometry is drastically different. Now instead of an octahedral, we're missing the whole bottom. And where that bottom fluorine was is what? You're right, a lone pair. So we can draw that now. So we can say what? We've got 7, 7 for iodine plus what? 35 for the 5 fluorines. That gives us a total of 42. If we put the iodine in the middle, and we go around again right now I'm just drawing a Lewis structure so don't freak out right I'm not drawing my 3d yet you always have to draw a Lewis structure first you're gonna say okay I've got my fluorines here 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 and here and that's already used up what one two three four five times two that used up two that gets me 32 now I've got to go ahead and go around and give all of these fluorines all these outside fluorines, they're octet, right? This is hopefully a little bit of review for you. If you're not confident in Lewis structures, I urge you to go watch a previous video or read and get more confident, work some old homeworks or whatnot. So now I've used up one, two, three, four, five times six. I've used up 30 and I've got two left. Where do those two need to go? Well, the only place left is going on this iodine. And that's really important to realize this iodine has a lone pair, which we did not have up above. 
So here you see that we're going to have five fluorines and a lone pair. And if we look at our uh, three-dimensional structure here, this molecular geometry, right? You can see that you kind of have the octahedral, but you're missing one, right? You're missing one because you have to make room because this this lone pair has taken the place of one of these fluorines. And so this changes our molecular geometry. So how might you draw this? What is this? This is a pyramid, right? It's a pyramid with a square bottom, not a triangle bottom. And so there are a couple different ways you can draw it. The easiest way would be like we did our trick above. We could put the four in the plane of the paper, right? We could say, okay, don't worry, I'll bring the molecule back. It's okay. I'm gonna put those there. And if you look back at our molecule, that's what I've drawn. I've drawn the, tr the, the, sorry, the square base. Now I don't have one behind, I only have one in front. So my life is pretty easy. I can just draw the wedge that is filled to show the one coming out at me. And that is a square pyramid. I hope that, that makes sense to you. If you look at the Spartan drawing, you can see a square pyramid is not all that scary. Now. I'm going to challenge you on your own to do something like, oh, I don't know. How about try uh, xenon tetrafluoride and, to sh and prove to yourself that there's going to be two lone pairs. And if we look at what happens to our geometry, right? If we get rid of one more of these atoms, right? If we kind of do this real quick together, sorry, the molecule is going to move. I'm going to delete that. And now what happens? I've got not only a lone pair below, but a lone pair above. And they end up pushing these other remaining four fluorine, or these, yeah, these four fluorines into a planar or square planar, right? Because this forms a square. And in drawing this is pretty easy because you just draw all four in a, a, a plane of the paper, pretty simple, almost like a little cross or a square. And there you go. That is now square planar. And all of these, again, were derived from what? They were derived from the octahedral. We started with an octahedral that had no lone pairs, only bonding, and we got a regular octahedron. Then we substituted one of the bonds for a lone pair, and we got the square pyramid. And then if we kick off another bond and replace it with a second lone pair, now we get the planar version, which is the square planar. So I hope this kind of makes sense that um, as you increase the lone pairs, your geometries change, but it's not that hard to deal with. Now the last one that is a little bit challenging, I think for many of you, is the uh, trigonal bipyramidal structure. And that's one that can be um, unfortunately a little bit um, annoying, but I'll try to go ahead and tackle this one as best I can. If I try to draw um, as there we go. I think I've got it now in Spartan for you. And you draw, you excuse me, you guys drew this one or will draw this one in lab when you deal with the molecular model kit. But I really want to show how this is by far the most complicated. And why is it the most complicated? Because only in this geometry do you have two unique types of hydrogen or types of uh, bonding pairs. And if you look here, you see that you have the two that we will call axial, because it almost looks like we're spinning a wheel on an axle, right? I can, ooh, I can go really fast. There you go. And you can look at that and say, well, that wheel is on an axle, and these bonding pairs are 90 degrees to the other bonding pairs. Same thing for the bottom. They're 90 degrees apart. That really denotes what a axial position looks like. If I rotate this down and spin the molecule a different way, you can see that that's the wheel, right? This is what we call the equatorial, the three equatorial hydrogens, right? And they are very different and unique in that they are separated not by 90 degrees, but by 120, right? Because you take a circle, which is 360, divide it by three, and you get 120. You know that, that's like junior high geometry. And so again, the ones above and below that form the axle, right? They are, in fact, if I, let you sp let, try to spin it again. Let's see if I can do this right. Um, oops, no, it's there we go. I'm gonna spin it this way, I think. Yeah, you can spin, right? You can see my, ah, uh, there you go, there you go. That looks pretty good, right? And then your axles here, these three that are lined up, and then the wheel is the equatorial position, then 120. So I hope that shows you there are two unique positions that are really important. 
And drawing this, I'm gonna go ahead and let you draw the Lewis structure on your own because you did this in class and in lab. If you wanna draw one, I think probably uh, the most uh, you know simple one to draw would be something like what PF, like PF5 would be a good one to look at. That would be perfectly fine, I think. Um, you can, I mean, your book has lots of examples, right? I'm not going to make you draw all these, and I'm not going to solve them all today. But what I want to focus on here is how can you then draw this monster? There are a couple of different ways you can do it, as you might imagine. Uh, some people like to do it in the trick way that I did before for the octahedron. I think you can see that you can fit all three of these equatorial plus the center atom in the plane of the paper, and you could draw it that way. You could say, okay, well, I'm going to draw the P in the middle. I'm gonna put the F here. I'm gonna put, uh, remember, you gotta keep these 120 degrees, right? As best you can. And that can show you, if I bring it back, um, here you go, this is a better way of it. There you go. So you see I've got the one fluorine going to the, to the right of the paper and the other two going kind of down 120 and then up 120. But these are all in the plane of the paper. And then of course you can see I've got one coming in and one going out. And so I can take the one here and I can say, okay, oh, I've got the one coming this way here and the one going that way behind the paper. And that's one way you can draw it. It's probably not the prettiest way to draw it. And so pe people typically will draw a trigonal by pyramidal side on like this configuration. And so you can see here, they've done the same thing. They put one, two, three atoms in the plane of the paper, actually four. So there's really no difference in the way I drew it above. This one probably looks much better. I'm gonna put my fluorine, my two axial fluorines here, and then I'm gonna put my first equatorial. And so if we kind of look back here, I hope you can see I've got the three kind of in that cross shape, that T shaped, if you will. And then I've got one uh, fluorine coming out at me, one going behind the paper. And so I'm gonna use my uh, wedge, my solid wedge here. Uh, that's not a very pretty one, but you get the idea. And then the dashed one. And I would say this bottom one is by far the, the prettiest one to draw because the other one looks kind of crazy. So I would draw the bottom one. And then if you drew something like, I don't know, in lab, didn't we draw uh, something like, oh, I don't know, uh, sulfur tetrafluoride, you can draw that one. And now that's gonna introduce one lone pair and that's gonna change the structure. And this is one we talked about, or you guys will talk about in class. And so whenever you wanna put a lone pair into a trigonal bipyramid, you always wanna put it not in the axial position, but you want it to be able to spread out because those lone pairs push really hard, they repel a lot. So let's go ahead and put it in the equatorial position. And I'm gonna go ahead and try to delete one of these and change it out with a, a lone pair. And so here you see that you get a, a very similar structure to what we drew before, but this is called a seesaw because it kind of looks like the old playground equipment, a little pivot point where the axials kind of can go up and down. And so here you can kind of see that where here's your little pivot point. And again, you can draw this pretty simply. I'm not gonna draw the whole thing for you, but we can draw it again with the uh, sulfur in the middle. And I'm gonna go ahead and draw my lone pair up here to help remind me. And then of course, I'm gonna have one coming out of the plane and one going um, behind the plane. And if we look at our picture, I think that matches pretty well to the three-dimensional structure here, which I think will make that, uh, remember what this one, this one is called what? Yeah, it's called Seesaw, right? It's kind of a weird name, but it's really important. Okay, so if we went to another molecule that's a little bit more challenging than this, we could say something like, oh, I don't know, challenge yourself and do BR, uh, F3 is one that I like as an example. This will take you to not one, but two lone pairs. And if we go to our molecule over here, we can uh, go ahead and then say, well, um, what do we do now? Well, again, we're gonna continue to put lone pairs in the equatorial positions. So we'll do that. And then we'll look back at our structure and notice what it does now. Now that we have two lone pairs, they occupy those two equatorial and what we see is a t-shape for the molecular geometry and that one's really easy to draw you can just sit there and draw it you can say br fluorine here 
flooring here and flooring there. They're all in the plane of the paper. And if you wanted to, you know, you can just draw the lone pairs like this. Or if it makes you feel better, you could kind of show that one of those is coming out towards you and one's going behind you. But again, we don't really see those. We only see the atoms. And so you're not going to see these lone pairs, but it's good to recognize that they're there. And that's what we call a T shape, like, like the letter T, right? Like Boba Fett's helmet has a T in it. Mr. T, right? I pay the fool if you can't get this one right. It's all good. And then the very, very last one I'll give you, uh, which makes this one even more unique, is that you could try xenon uh, difluoride, which goes not to one, not to two, but this is going to give you three lone pairs, which is pretty crazy, right? Three lone pairs. Um, and if you go back to our molecule, there is only one more equatorial left. And if you take that one and you finally get rid of that last bond and replace it with a lone pair, well, it becomes pretty easy that you've now gone all the way from trigonal bipyramid to a linear molecule, which becomes you know something as simple as just realizing that you've got a xenon with two fluorines and then where those equatorial bonds used to be are now three lone pairs in the orientation of the equatorial positions but we, we, we really don't see those when you do the molecular geometry so boom you kind of just see this linear thing which again all of these are based on the family that originated from trigonal bipyramid, but we just increasingly remove a bonding pair and replace it with a lone pair, and it changes the molecular geometry. So in this video, I know it went a little bit long, but many of you asked for this, so I wanted to carve out some time this evening to try to do it so I can help you um, and show that I'm trying to support you going into this next exam. So I've done all of the possible molecular geometries uh, that you might see with the exception of like trigonal planar and um you know uh, uh, i think that's the and, and, a, and a, like a linear one that you know you would see for a really simple molecule like cyanide or something that's or carbon dioxide um, but those are pretty easy i wanted to spend my time on the the tetrahedral family the octahedral family and the trigonal bipyramid family because I think those are the ones that students in my experience have had the most difficult uh, time trying to draw on a piece of paper or they just had a hard time conceptualizing and so um, I hope this has been helpful um, you know hang in there with everything that's going on and all the work you're doing all I know a lot of you, you guys are writing reports for other labs and whatnot so try to carve out time to work those practice problems and uh, you know prepare for the exam and I know you can do this just keep working hard and do your best and as always uh, Wabash always fights so um, take care and catch you next time